Welcome to the final webinar in our series on Artificial Intelligence and the Interpreter. Bienvenue au dernier webinaire de notre série L'intelligence artificielle et l'interprète. Benvenuti all'ultimo della nostra serie di webinar sull'intelligenza artificiale e l'interprete. Welkom bij het laatste webinar in onze reeks over kunstmatige intelligentie en de tolk. Witamy na ostatnim webinarze z cyklu Sztuczna Inteligencja a Tłumaczenie Ustne. What did we want to achieve in this series? We realized that denial is not helpful. And uh, mocking dismissal won't be helpful either. So when you're approached by a client who asks you about a machine interpretation um, option for their next conference, it, it will not be helpful if you just start laughing. And it is far better to be prepared with information and advice. And then you'll be able to show your value as a human, a real interpreter. And who knows, for some assignments or for some clients, a machine might be good enough and you might want to let those go. But in other cases, it might be worth your effort to educate and inform so that you can win that client over. But not just with the quality of your work, but also with your knowledge and your professionalism. AI, we believe, I believe, is just another twist in our profession's history. And not the first one, won't be the last, but it doesn't have to be fatal if you don't allow it to be. So this is what we're going to talk about today with some excellent knowledgeable speakers who understand recruitment of interpreters, understand market patterns and understand technology. And they can offer valuable insights into how the future may look for us. Tom Jays from the European Parliament, he's head of strategy and, and innovation unit uh, in DG Link and director general for logistics and interpretation for conferences. Antonio Paoletti from the International Maritime Organization, uh, UN agency. He's head of the meeting services and interpretation section at the IMO. And they both represent international organizations which are major recruiters of interpreters. We also have Naomi Bowman here the CEO of DS Interpretation, and she can shed light on the private market. The two experts on automated speech translation from our first webinar, Dr. Jan Newhus from the University of Maastricht is here, and uh, Dr. William Lewis, who's an uh, um, affiliate assistant professor at the University, or Department of Linguistics, University of Washington. And they will be here to answer any AI technology related questions. It's so good to see you. Thank you for being here. Right, let us start. And uh, I think the first question should be about the institutional market, about the experience so far. So experience with AI so far on the institutional market and the private market. So the question would be to uh, Tom and uh, Antonio. Does your institution have any experience with AI? Uh, and if so, what has it been? And maybe there are some plans for the future. Um, shall I go first, Monica? Um, so I think the answer can be relatively short. Um, we don't have a great deal of experience when it comes to artificial intelligence. Um, it's something that interests us, of course, and um, as an institution, politically, um, there is a great deal of, of interest, I would say, even fasc fascination for artificial intelligence. Um, but for the time being, experience is rather limited. Um, I, I should say from a political perspective, um, the parliament has set up a committee uh, to look into various regulatory issues uh, on artificial intelligence to make sure that technology is human centered and ethical and dealt with responsibly and so on. Um, from an administrative point of view, um, we do have a number of DGs that have projects um, that use artificial intelligence, um, chatbots, uh, things of that nature. And we have one DG in particular, DG Trad, um, that is running um, a speech to text uh, service or is setting up a speech to text service, which is uh, perhaps of, of more interest to the to the interpreting community. Um, the idea there is that um, the speech to text and translation um, service that's going to be set up uh, will be a, a kind of complement to the interpreters in the room. It'll be a complement to um, getting uh, the, the debates more accessible to European citizens, uh, but it's in no way meant to replace them. Uh, human interpreting is all about making sure that meetings can happen, uh, that participants can engage uh, interactively within the meeting room so that they can discuss things, come to decisions, 
um, convince each other. Uh, it's all part of uh, parliamentary debate. Um, whereas DG Trad's prospect um, project is more about um, opening up accessibility. Um, within DG Link, responsible for interpreting uh, and conference organization, um, we're also very interested in artificial intelligence for the future. Uh, not so much um, in the field of language technology per se, uh, but we do have a strong interest in the potential of artificial intelligence um, for things like um, interpreting support services. Um, what I mean by that is recruitment, uh, programming, putting teams of interpreters together in very complex permutations. Um, we have at any one uh, time in the parliament language uh, regimes of up to 24 uh, different languages and um, several dozens of meetings happening um, on a given day in parallel. Uh, what that means is that the job of putting people in the right place and switching them out when, when languages change is extremely complex. Um, the algorithms and the permutations are very, very, very difficult. Um, if we combine that with the need to plan ahead and um, do some succession planning to make sure we've got the right languages covered and so on, uh, it becomes extremely complex very quickly. And there we see a real tantalizing prospect with artificial intelligence. Um, it's perhaps not the sort of thing that you were um, expecting to hear from an interpreting service in this particular context, but that really is the, the focus for us. And I think that if we see artificial intelligence in, in our DG in the next year or two, it will be particularly focused on, on that area, um, making sure that the support services are well uh, equipped um, using that, that kind of possibility. Uh, one, one potential as well for, for interpreter support uh, is the possibility to have um, uh, speaker bios and speaker information being brought up uh, on top of a screen, and uh, an overlay screen. That kind of thing can use um, facial recognition software and so on. Uh, these are all things that, that have been thought about, they've been considered, but we don't, as I say, have a roadmap or a plan to implement any of these things for the time being. Um, I'm here, by the way, as much uh, to learn as anything else, and, and I did have the opportunity to hear uh, William and Jan speak in the, the earlier webinars fascinating stuff um, and I think we we as an institution need to keep our, our ears close to the ground and, um, and and see what's going on in the outside world and what the interpreting community thinks of it as well. Thank you very much for this and uh, Antonio do you have anything to add? We would really love to hear about the UN sector. Thank you, thank you very much Mark and thank you, um, thank you for having me here today. Um, just echoing what, what, what Tom has just said, we don't have much experience of, we haven't expanded much into ANI as far as our interpretation services are concerned. I think it's, um, I think Tom mentioned something which is very valuable and we value the work of people rather than machines. And I think interpretation will uh, be about people for a very, very long time. I don't think there is any, any prospect in the future to say that a machine will replace the interpreter. I, I can't see that happening. With regards to interpretation, we are not, um, at the stage of having implemented any any um, AI solution, we are keeping our, our you know we are keeping our minds open. We we we, we keep on looking around because we have to um, we have to look forward. I think from 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 our perspective, we are not um, shutting the door or anything. If there are solutions out there that will help and support our interpreters, then we will we we'll look at them. We we'll, we we'll try to implement them. Um, but for the time being, interpretation services remains um, fairly standard. I mean, organizing a, a conferences with six official languages is already bad enough. I can't think what Tom's life is like having you know, to organize a conference with 24 different languages and the various permutation and combinations and so on and so forth. We have, as far as language services are concerned, we have recently introduced the eLuna system or the eLuna software, and some of you will, will be aware of it. I'm certainly not an expert and I, 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 I've gone to um, my colleagues who work in the documentation sections and they are the people who know more about it. But even the eLuna um, software has been introduced as support to our translators. It's not a tool that replaces the translator. It's um, the way I understand the way it works, Luna, it just take, it takes a text, it chunks it off, it presents it to translators, and then it sort of searches for parallels and similarities with uh, previously translated text, and it brings it to the attention of translators. It goes back to UN terminology database, or so you look up um, how certain technical terms have been translated before. Um, 
finalized target, delivers a chunk of translation into a word format where you can insert comments or not insert comments and so on and so forth. But we are still at the stage of the system being there to support the team of translators rather than to take over the work that translators um, do within, within the activities of the IMO. Uh, certainly, um, I cannot speak on behalf of the UN or uh, the UN system. Certainly, uh, I, can, I can talk on behalf of our um, interpretation services within the IMO, which is part of the UN system. But the, the Luna certainly is, is a great tool. It is being used by a number of agencies, a number of programs of the UN by the main UN and it seems to be of a certain benefit. With regards to, um, to the future, we are looking into a trial in some sort of speech to tech systems. We are working with um, the company that looks after our audio files archives some years ago. We um, did away with verbatim reports of our conferences and we only record our meetings and we archive the audio files, we obviously with the provision of the disclaimer, which we have agreed with AIC and so on and so forth. And so our, our member states have asked us to look into the possibility of being able to search the audio files, to search by, by uh, oral communication or to search by, by uh, going from, from, from the speech and uh, be able to extract a text from the system. We are trialing this. We are working with one of our contractors, which is a company called Slick, uh, based in Canada, and they are looking after the um, audio files side of it. But we haven't, um, we haven't got any results of the trial yet. So I, I wouldn't be able to offer any um, figures with regards to accuracy of the, of, of the, of the results. I mean, it's... Um, um, it's not an exact science, and, 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 and I think we discussed this before. With regards to machines taking over the interpretation side of it, um, there, there are too many, too many question marks. There are too many uh, you know, suspended things. It is a problem of uh, pronunciation. If you if you take into account a meeting of the UN in in a, in a conference hall like the one we have in IMO, about 750 delegates. Or, or a thousand delegates if, if we combine two venues, you have at least 60%, 70% of these people who are speaking in a language which is not their mother tongue. So it's, it's the accents, the pronunciation, the different versions of, of languages, which I, I assume, I'm not, a, I'm not a, as you know, I'm not a linguist, I'm not a specialist, but I assume would be major challenges for um, uh, interpretation AI system developers. I hope that helps. That helps a lot and it's very reassuring as well. Uh, but also it you sort of um, it ties in with what we learned from our previous webinars that you write accents will be uh, very tricky. But let's not preempt a further discussion. Naomi, do clients ask for AI instead of human interpreters? Okay, thanks, Monica. This is a wonderful question. Um, AI is talked about everywhere. Everyone hears it almost every day. And so naturally, clients have an expectation that AI has permeated our industry. Not only do they have an expectation, they assume that we are using AI. I want to tell a little story. I've been working in this field for more than 30 years. And more than 30 years ago, when I was at events, talking with people in the audience, collecting receivers, passing out receivers, inter interacting with people, the assumption more than 30 years ago was that this was being done through AI. <laughs> So I need to bring that to everybody's attention. You hold up a receiver and people actually thought decades ago that the machine was doing this. So keep that in perspective. Um, yes, clients do ask for AI, but, but not only that, they sometimes don't know the difference. I had a client meeting this week um, with a client I've worked with for more than 25 years. And their end user client 
had used some AI solutions recently, but people were unaware, to be honest, that these were not human solutions. So I had to point it out. And I said, listen, if you need to have an accurate interpretation, if you need to focus on accuracy of delivery, you should not use AI right now for this situation. So AI needs to be thought of in the context of appropriate use. But yes, clients are asking for AI. Clients um, think we're already using AI to a great extent. And a huge part of my job is educating the clients. Do you think AI is likely to be used in conference settings anytime soon? Because we know there are certain limitations. I, I think that um, we're already seeing the use, some of the use of this technology in kind of conference settings. It depends on the scenario, it depends on the topic. So what we've seen, especially in uh, like education conferences, because it's becoming more acceptable to use this technology in the classroom, uh, not, uh, I mean, the, the technology itself kind of breaks down into two parts. You have kind of like the automatic captioning where it generates transcripts on what people are saying. That is fairly pervasive in, in education circles because you have the accessibility scenarios and they tend to use this technology in those kinds of scenarios. And then you have the layer of translation on top of that. Uh, we're seeing that again, as I mentioned in, in, in uh, as Jan and I mentioned in our talks, we're seeing it being used in the classroom in lecture settings, like in, uh, in higher education, but uh, I think more pervasively in, in uh, K through 12 or uh, lower education. Um, in education conferences, I've seen this used where you have uh, someone who's presenting to an audience and then has a large audience of educators, let's say, and wants to demonstrate the technology. We've kind of seen it in those scenarios or where it's being used uh, extensively in, uh, uh, in a kind of presentation in a conference. What this usually involves is uh, people in the audience are receiving captions on their local device and have the option of translating it into their, uh, their specific languages on their device. Now this is simultaneous in the sense that it's uh, you know near real time as far as capturing the what's being said. You have uh, the uh, the audio uh, being converted into a, a, a transcription feed or into a caption feed, and then that's being translated. Um, and I think uh, in my presentation, you saw that there are errors in this. It's a machine, of course. It's going to make mistakes, and it will make mistakes that humans don't make, which is is notable. Humans make mistakes too, right? But the kinds of mistakes the machines make are very different kinds of mistakes and they tend to be more of them. So um, as far as uh, broader use uh, of the technology, what we are seeing, uh, the COVID-19 has opened some opportunities here that didn't, ex didn't weren't really being taken up. So you have these online tools for meetings. So let's take Zoom, for instance, or Teams or uh, Google Hangouts or whatever. And you're seeing the integration of these automated technologies into those online meeting tools. And you see like uh, for Teams, I can talk about Teams in particular, just because I helped work on that project. Um, when captioning was activated, it the, the usage just went through the roof with COVID-19. All of a sudden, everyone was turning it on because it wasn't just an accessibility thing. It's like, oh, I just wanted to take notes for me. I wanna see what's being said so I can see, uh, do note taking. Now that's monolingual, it's just in one language, but that's very soon gonna be something where you can turn on, it's like uh, I, I have a meeting with people that speak another language in Teams, they can then get the caption feed in, in their specific languages. As an aid, it's not meant to replace an interpreter. It's not meant to replace the, the communication that's occurring there. But if someone speaks Italian, let's say, and whose English is not particularly strong, getting a caption feed in English and, and Italian helps them understand what's being said in the meeting. It's just an aid for the meeting. Um, one last thing I do wanna say as far as like uh, in, in uh, the note that you sent me, uh, you know, political meetings and, and, and parliaments and this kinds of things. Um, I don't see that being used online currently. Uh, we are seeing some use of the technology offline. So let's take the Welsh Assembly or Seneth Cymru, you know, in, in Wales. They 
are using the technology, the, the same basic technology, you know, the transcription and the translation in their workflows. So when a meeting happens, they have the audio from the meeting that gets fed into a, you know, offline, it gets fed into an automated service that someone then goes and makes corrections to what the automated service generates and then corrects the translations. So they have an entire system set up for someone, for people to go in there and make corrections to the underlying uh, uh, captions and underlying uh, translations. Um, uh, it's their own solution. It's something they've built themselves. Uh, I, one of your ta uh, speakers talked about Iluna. Uh, Iluna doesn't do that. Iluna is, uh, a, 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 I believe, a, a computer-assisted translation tool, but it's in the same vein, if you will. The UN and agencies developed Iluna, for instance, to do uh, translation editing, so that provides automated translations, and then someone corrects those automated translations. So it's analogous. What the assembly is doing for the Welsh Assembly is doing, for instance, is analogous in that sense, except they're dealing with audio feed, not translations, but actual audio feed that are being done offline and then burned into videos that are then uh, provided to the public. Thank you very much, Will. That's really interesting. Um, we know that university settings and classroom settings, when you have a lecture, it works pretty well sometimes, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, but my question would be, Jan, if you could elaborate on the, the parliament setting, because it, Will start, as, started um, this whole thread, and I, I would really be interested as a human being, not as an interpreter that might be replaced someday. But, you know, in parliament, when you have a debate, lots and lots of speakers, okay, it's orderly, sometimes less so, but how likely is it that an AI device or solution could cope with that, is it at all likely? Is it something that is impossible? What do you think? Um, I mean, I think at least in the European Parliament, where there's like people speaking different languages, it's a quite structured uh, debate. It's not like I think in the British Parliament where people like interrupt each other. That would, of course, be a big advantage for automatic interpretation. However, I think the stacks in the parliament are just so high that, I mean, people will use the technology as first in many, many other situations before they will really use it in, in the parliament. So uh, when, when talking about using this technology, I think it's more about all the situations where currently there's no interpretation and that's most of the situation. Uh, I mean, I think once I saw it, like I, it was used for me for a demo when I gave an English talk in, in China, because I mean, they wouldn't afford for that an interpreter. And there, I mean, that's the same, that's a school situation and many others. Um, so, and there we, we see also simultaneous uh, applications because we have seen recently a lot of research on that. A lot of uh, groups have worked on improving it. So I think, this normally takes a bit till it's really in the products, but there, there will be quite an improvement. However, I don't see that uh, really in scenarios uh, where, where currently interpreters are, uh, and that's uh, less about the simultaneous aspect. It's more about the aspect that there might be more errors and worse errors, and people don't trust AI that much, and, and they will not for some time, I think. So uh, I think that's the bigger issue, like how to trust than, than the simultaneous aspect. Yeah, I, think, I think that's true. I mean, the, the issue is if, uh, what's the cost for the error? If it's a catastrophic error, for instance, or if there's a problem that creates a catastrophe, that could be detrimental, right? So yeah, I think that's true. Debbie, anything interesting from any interesting comments from the chat already? I think uh, we've I've seen quite a bit of um, co a few comments on Twitter as well. Thank you so much to Naomi for her very good points that we have to keep educating our clients and as Monica said, also ourselves. Uh, one of the uh, colleagues mentioned that it's maybe our fault as interpreters for always doing such a good job, staying in the background and always pretending to be neutral and invisible. So I guess that has aggravated that um, idea that we are just machines or robots. Monica, you. I would like to add um, a comment further to your last question regarding simultaneous AI. Um, we have employed an artificial intelligence solution in a conference setting 
uh, using simultaneous <laughs> artificial intelligence interpreting. And we agreed to do this because the client specifically requested it. They were looking for a new technology solution. They had no budget to provide interpreting otherwise. They had no budget to provide human interpreters. So the choice was an AI solution or no interpreting. So it was about providing access. And the setting was such that it was conducive to a more successful outcome because of the style of the presenters and the meetings. And how did it go? Um, their expectations were relatively low and it worked better than everybody expected. It was surprisingly good. Now, was it as good as humans? Of course not. But I do want to mention that it exceeded the expectations of the users. Um, how simultaneous was it? Well, it was like what Will and Jan were describing. It was um, speech to text, but then it, that was converted to audio. So it was uh, a, a few seconds delay more than human interpreters would have been, but it wasn't uh, significant. And it worked and they were happy enough with it that they want to continue doing it. And this might concern people, but I want to focus on the fact that I felt it was an appropriate application of AI with very specific parameters that were met to be successful. I think it's time to announce another poll. And uh, thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much, Naomi, for easing us into this, because we want to ask you, the audience, what advantages do we as human interpreters have to offer over automatic speech translation solutions? So the poll is now open and uh, we look forward to hearing from everyone. And now let us move on. You mentioned, Naomi, your client who wouldn't be able to pay for interpreters and they had certain expectations and the what you offered actually exceeded the expectations. Now, um, we know that there are some challenges that AI has to overcome, some difficulties, and we know that the better the speaker speaks in a certain way, um, clearly, full sentences, etc., it will be easier for AI to do a good job. And the question I would like to put to you today is would your clients, private market, institutional market, Tom and Will, be prepared to change the way they speak so that they can get the most out of AI? For example, because they want to save money or because they, they simply think it's a great opportunity to promote science or whatever the reasons, would they be prepared to change the way they speak? Uh, shall we start with Tom? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I think that there's a very straightforward answer to this one as well. Um, and the answer is no. Um, I think that um, members of parliament in particular, but to be honest, most clients uh, would not be willing to change the way they speak in order to serve um, the, the, the machine. Or, or rather to get a better result out of the machine. I think um, there's a very basic principle that technology should be at the service uh, of human beings and not the other way around. And I think most people would agree with that. Um, I, I could imagine a situation, and it ties in a little bit with what was just said, um, where there's no alternative. Um, there really is no alternative than to use some kind of a, an artificial solution. Um, and under those circumstances, and under those circumstances alone, uh, a member of parliament would want to adapt the way they speak in order to make sure they got the very best out of the, the system or the solution. Um, but otherwise, I mean, people speak the way they speak and they make a point in the way that they think um, is, is fitting for the situation. Um, there's another element that's perhaps worth mentioning, which is um, speaking well is not a choice for the most part. It's, uh, it's a talent, it's a skill, 
Um, and not people, generally speaking, don't speak well. I mean, I, I include myself in this category. We speak in half sentences. We, we, we make mistakes. We correct ourselves. Choosing to speak in a very perfect, eloquent and clear way is, is not within the capabilities of, of the vast majority of people. Politicians, admittedly, are, are among the better speakers. Um, but choosing to, to speak more slowly, for example, um, usually people... Uh, make an effort for a few seconds and then quickly lapse into their, their preferred mode of, of speech. So I think asking people to speak in a certain way in order to, to get the best results out of a machine is, is pretty much doomed to failure. Um, to be honest, I, I see that as the challenge or one of the challenges that the, the technology has to overcome. They have to take the way human beings speak, um, the way we use the language in practice, and they have to deal with it. And until such time as, as they've dealt with it suitably, um, then, then we wouldn't be able to use it in, in any kind of realistic way. I, I do remember uh, back uh, when I was studying linguistics many, many years ago, um, that there was an, um, a project to, to try to automatically translate um, uh, using Canadian weather reports, I believe. And the reasoning for that was that it was very, very um, routine and there was a standard pattern that was regularly produced and it would, it would be easier to, to replicate the speech. And that's the sort of area where where this started, but unless it wants, unless it um, it gets considerably better, and I'm sure it has since then, unless it learns to deal with the, the vagaries of human speech and the way we misuse the the, the languages, um, then it, it simply won't be fit for purpose. Um, I, I think there's there's probably an element that all linguists in the room know, but when you go into a room and you speak to someone, it's a it's a human to human interaction. And it's done on the basis of a shared understanding of the outside world, a common understanding of the context. And a machine has to overcome the fact it does not know the context. Um, Jan and Will, I'm sure, have much better idea of how machines can do that, how they can attempt it. And, and I can't even begin to, to say whether, whether that's a challenge that they will overcome in the future. Um, but, but one thing is for certain, uh, we cannot expect uh, the clients or the users of interpreting to adapt to the, the, the weaknesses or the vulnerabilities of the machine. Otherwise, um, it, it simply will not wash. Uh, that's my opinion, at least. Thank you. I remember Will saying, and I quoted you, Will, uh, machines have to respect that and machines have to honour that. And this is this is precisely, this ties in with what, what, what you're saying, Tom, as well. Antonio, I'm assuming that, uh, I think I know the answer, but please, Tell us about your delegates, about your clients. They would not be happy to adapt or to adjust their way of speaking, would they? Um, so, some of them might be, some of them may not. They tend to be fairly reluctant to, you know, be, I guess it's a bit of a patronizing term to educate speakers because people speak the way they speak. And, and there are also some other um, obstacles to, you know, how would you educate, for example, and I won't mention names or delegations, but we had a, a delegate who attended uh, IMO meetings for years and years, and uh, and he had um, a dreadful stammer. You know, what, what do you say to that person? How do you educate that person to speak differently? You can't, and it'd be a serious, a serious problem with that. Um, you you have people that um, are not trained speakers. I mean, Tom would probably deal with lots of parliamentarians, and we know parliamentarians spend hours and hours in uh, in learning how to speak, how to deliver, how to uh, adjust their body language, uh, their inflection, and 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 delivery of speech to 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 suit their needs. But if you um, um, if you have a bunch of um, uh, naval architects, marine biologists who are coming to a meeting in IMO because they are experts in their particular field, but they're not experts at public speaking. Um, how do you educate? You can't educate them and give them a crash course on how to speak in public. Um, if you have a francophone delegate from Canada, a francophone delegate from, from an Afghan country, they may speak differently. Their delivery may be different. So it, it, isn't, it isn't a particularly easy task, and I don't think it would be easy to implement it. We have noticed, for example, since the, um, the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic, because you know, sooner or later we're going to have to talk about that, but before, before the end of February 2019, let, let, let's say not even half of us had heard of these um, um, remote interpretation platforms and named, I won't name companies or whatever. And then all of a sudden in two weeks, 
Now that, that I was talking to the representatives of the one we use, and I won't mention which company, but they had a demand of conferencing hours of 3,000 per week. And in at the beginning of February, at mid-March, they had 250,000 hours per week. So, you know, the, 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 the whole utilization of these platforms, mushrooms out of control. We have been trying to run um, onboarding sessions for our delegates before each meeting. And we spend, I personally spend three hours every meeting before the start of the meeting onboarding delegates. And we try to educate delegates in a, in a polite and diplomatic manner and ask them to use the proper settings, ask them to use proper equipment, uh, to speak slowly, to send us copies of their statements in advance so we can give them to interpreters and have the interpreters in, the, in, in their work. And it's, it's an uphill struggle. It, it is not a message that is getting through um, half as much as we would like to. So the, the the answer again, and, and I go along with, with what Tom said. The answer is is a very sounding no. It's not an easy thing to implement. One thing that I saw some comments um, earlier on in the chat about interpreters having been, uh, you know, too, too quiet in the background and not acknowledged. At one point, we've been trying to make in uh, certain IMO, but I'm sure in other international organizations, is to fact that the work and the skills of the interpreters have to be highlighted, they have to be acknowledged. So in our meeting, at the beginning end of every meeting in the brief, there's always an acknowledging of the work of the interpreters, of the booths, and so on and so forth. They're very visible, and we try to give them as much, um, as much space as, as possible. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, okay, well, Naomi, do you have anything to add to that? Yes. I assume you I assume you through. Yes. Um, in general, I agree that humans speak the way they want to. Uh, I have so many stories of, of trying to get speakers to slow down. Usually that results in them speeding up, to be honest. Um, trying to get speakers to do anything, to wear headsets in, the, in this RSI world, this voice over IP world, it's an uphill battle, as Antonio said. But one of the things that I, I really feel we need to keep in mind is not to focus on speakers changing how they speak, but on the audience and the listeners changing, if you will, how they listen. Um, Will said that AI right now is considered a communication aid for MS Teams meetings. And I have long um, quoted something about interpreters. Simultaneous interpretation is a communication aid for the sole and immediate use of the participants present at the conference. It is not intended to be a translated, edited, perfectly correct product. It's a communication aid. And everybody needs to think about the fact that the audience expectations here, especially with the advent of AI, I believe are going to change. The market is going to be very forgiving and perfection and accuracy are not going to be as expected. Are they still important? Yes, but in certain settings, good enough may be good enough. And this is one of actually the concerns that I have is this softening of the market expectations for linguistic accuracy over time. Um, I see it now just with texting and this sort of thing. We all communicate by text. We used to text in complete sentences. Most people don't even use punctuation anymore. <laughs> Emojis, everything else. Language is changing. How we communicate is changing. And I do believe that this change is going to creep in to the conference interpreting world over time, especially um, especially in the area of business meetings, webinars, um, non-discussion presentations, keynote presentations, and that sort of thing. That is a very different world than parliamentary or United Nations discussions. 
so I wanted to point that out. The market is changing how they listen to language. So if you think about it, what you said about um, expectations and conference interpreting the, the entire world and changing, changing patterns and changing expectations as such, what does that mean for the profession? Is it a threat? And if it's not the threat to the profession, what is? I mean, what are the threats to the profession? Is it AI really? Um, because we, I think we've established that AI is really not entirely a threat. It's probably more of a twist or a, something that requires us to pivot a little bit, but not necessarily threatens our survival. So what are the threats? Commoditization, RSI, AI, or maybe no interpre interpretation whatsoever. I think this is something that Tom once said, that no interpretation whatsoever might be a threat. Tom, would you mind telling us more about your view on that, the threat? Sure. What is it? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to I'm happy to express my views on this. I think um, uh, artificial intelligence is not a threat in in and of itself. Um, I think it, it can be a threat if people don't react to it properly, and it, and it can be a threat if if the community as a whole doesn't know how to deal with it. Um, but I don't think it's it's a, a major threat, and it's certainly not. Uh, it wouldn't be on my list of top five threats to the profession. Um, to me, the, the the largest threat to conference interpreting as it exists now is the same threat that's existed ever since um, uh, I can remember, which is the, the threat of no interpretation whatsoever, the threat that the client will not choose to, to opt for interpretation, either because it's too expensive or because it doesn't meet exactly the conditions that the client needs or because uh, there are no interpreters available. There can be hundreds of reasons for it. But for whatever reason, uh, a client or an organizer of a meeting chooses not to employ interpreters because they think it's not necessary. Um, I think that's a huge threat. Uh, we've, we, live in, we live in a world where um, th this good enough uh, idea is, is certainly out there. Um, Naomi's quite right. Um, people speak uh, English um, more and more in most of the institutions that, that, that I'm aware of. And, um, and trying to, to, to promote the importance of interpreting as a way of getting a clear message across and making people understand that interpreting is doing them a service as well. This is the key, this is the key challenge. Um, so I think that um, this is something that the community as a whole should probably keep in mind. Um, the, the threat of, uh, of things like remote interpreting. Remote interpreting was a, was a huge threat or perceived as a huge threat to the profession some five, 10 years ago. And now, particularly with COVID, uh, many people are considering it to be a, something of a lifeline, uh, maybe something that's not so bad after all. Um, there are lots of different opinions on it, I know. Uh, but to me, uh, the, the major threat both to interpreters and to, to multilingual multilateralism is, is no interpreting whatsoever. Thank you very much. Antonio, would you like to come in on that? Uh, yes, thank you, Monica. Um, absolutely, absolutely. I don't... Um, number one, AI, I think we, we, we have to uh, start dissecting this idea of AI as soon as a big monster. We, 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 um, we go home and, and, and many of us will probably ask Alexa to you know, dig out a, a couple of songs or you ask Siri to find your way around when you, when you got lost around Paris or whatever it is. So we, you know, we love AI in that context, which is the basic forms of AI. But when it comes to when when it comes to our professional lives and our uh, wallet, then we see as a massive threat to the profession. Is AI a threat? Uh, no, I don't think AI would be a threat to the profession. AI, would, if um, I think Monica, you hit the nail on the head in your opening remarks there about it, it's all about the approach that we are all going to have towards this concept, towards this. Uh, technology advancing and developing because technology is not going to stop whether you know you know you're, you're not going to stop with me the, the, like don quixote they, 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 they keep on turning technology we keep on changing and moving forward so denial i think you said and i'm quoting you denial is not helpful and all this doom and gloom is not helpful embracing whatever it is and trying to adapt and and use it for our own uh, purposes and, and and make our life easier make your life because i'm not an interpreter make your life easy an interpreter, yes, that would be very welcome. But to me, what is more of a real threat, a very tangible one to the profession is the, 
the economic crisis that the world will be or is facing already, will be facing in the next few years. We had a restructure within the IMO, which is in UN term, it's it's a Cinderella, it's a very small UN agency. Um, we had the restructure of our um, technical bodies um, calendar in 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 uh, in a matter of a, a few weeks of discussion in our council, we lost four conference weeks per year because out of the nine subcommittees, which are our technical bodies, they were they were you know combined into seven. So two of the subcommittees were were done away with. So the the, the that is that is a real threat. That is the, the you know the, the, the interpreter sitting on an iceberg and the ice melting. That that is that is the real tangible threat. The other thing is member states are going to be asking for um, savings. They are going to be asking for savings because they are going to be faced with massive budgetary um, problems, mostly due to the COVID-19. Don't forget that the governments around the world are going to be struggling to pay the debts that they have accumulated in trying to address the COVID-19 situation. So that is probably a threat, lack of conference days, conference hours, meetings, uh, or, or reduction or, or diminishing in the decreasing number of conference days. Uh, that I would say that is much more of a real threat than, than the advancements into any sort of AI uh, or any sort of technology form. I mean, technology is always a bit scary. I, I, I was born and grew up in a small village in Tuscany. And, and when I was a kid, um, people didn't have a phone at home. They, they'll go to a, a local bar or a local osteria to make a phone call. And then, you know, almost overnight, most of the families had, a, had a, a telephone at home. My granddad saw that was a threat because, you know, oh, God, you know, that thing in the house or whatever. So every generation has seen some technology advancements as threatening whatever they had, but they're not necessarily. Uh, that's not necessarily a, a danger to us. What is a danger to us is the fact that the um, the, the, the number, the, the, the amount of work I can offer to an interpreter is going to be reduced. Thank you very much, uh, Antonio and Tom. Uh, very wise words. I, I absolutely agree. And I think our audience agrees as well, because I can see some positive comments in the chat. Naomi, in one of the uh, previous webinars, there was a question uh, put to in the in the in Slido that got a lot of votes, and the question was about RSI platforms, and also about AI. Now there seems to be, or rather, people seem to think that there is a link. Uh, is there a link? Uh, would you mind shedding light on this? RSI AI is that in any way linked in terms of business terms? Okay, um, great question, Monica. Of course, there's a link <laughs> because. RSI platform companies are technology companies and any technology company that is not looking at the benefits of artificial intelligence for its business models is, is foolish. AI has to be considered um, by any technology company for their business. All of the RSI platform companies, it should be assumed, are looking at how they can integrate artificial intelligence. Is that a threat <laughs> to all of us? Um, it depends. It depends on how you look at it. I want to I want to just tie this into your previous question about the greatest threat. To me, the greatest threat is the commoditization, you use that word, you took it right out of my mouth, the commoditization of conference interpreting due to the lack of differentiation of different types of interpreting and, and language services in general. I believe that AI actually plays a role in magnifying our language diversity, our global language diversity. And it helps celebrate our diversity, make people aware of it, and expect to be able to have access to language services. So I view that as a really, really positive thing. But we have to differentiate types of interpreting, conference interpreting in particular, and use AI appropriately 
when it can be appropriately provided as a solution. So I hope that answers your question. It definitely does. I think it's time to announce the results of our poll, because I think we're all uh, looking forward to hearing what our audience thinks um, about how we can make a difference, what we can offer um, that is better than automatic speed translation solutions. Louise, are you online? I am indeed. Um, yes, good evening, everyone. And thank you for the very thoughtful replies to our poll question. A little more of a testing question this time. What advantages do human interpreters have to offer over automatic speech translation solutions? Um, an impossible task to summarise <laughs> these many, many contributions. But there are some common themes, of course, and you can look through these on Slido yourselves if you wish. Um, I think the main themes are that human interpreters have the ability to look uh, beyond the words to the message and the argument. Um, people have pointed out that meaning is much more than words um, and that interpreters have to interpret the unsaid um, in some cases. Um, empathy was also a word which cropped up many times. Um, the idea that we need to be alert to the, we can be alert to the emotions and state of mind of our speakers and adapt our tone accordingly. So um, someone gave the example of um, not announcing that the, the chairman um, has died in a cheerful voice, but rather um, with suitable gravitas. Um, emotional intelligence falls into the same category. Uh, human interpreters are more pleasant to listen to than machines at the moment. Um, Antonio had mentioned uh, the non-standard pronunciation that you get at international meetings and it's been pointed out that uh, human interpreters are better at the moment at taking account of accents, non-standard pronunciation, and editing out um, any bad English, for example, um, that's here, you can see it in the list, um, and, and therefore that we make our speakers sound better. Um, and Naomi talked about accuracy um, earlier, and that point is also made in these very many thoughtful uh, answers. So thank you very much for that. Thank you very much, Louise. Um, what you said, what everyone here said, and uh, the answers in the, in the poll uh, sort of tie in with that. It's uh, beautifying the speaker. We are able to do that. The machine will not be able to do that. So it's this human element. And on this note, a question to Will and Jan. Um, some of our um, some of our colleagues pointed out that the entire series is about automated speech translation, that automated speech translation. And I know, uh, Will, that you absolutely hate the term artificial speech translation. OK, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but I know you don't like it. Uh, so fair enough, automated speech translation. But there was a question from one of our colleagues. Why is it speech translation? Why don't you use the proper word, which is interpretation? Now, the uh, I'm going to ask, this is a leading question. Is it because of the human element that is sort of implicit in the word interpretation? Could you please elaborate on that? Could you please tell us why you use speak translation instead of interpretation. Uh, Jan and I talked a little bit offline on chat. I'm going to let him answer. So. Uh, so I think it's more of a yeah historic thing that, I mean, first there was automated translation and there was automatic speech recognition and people just put the things together and then they came up, uh, they called it automated speech uh, translation. So for me, it's more a sign of yeah, that there maybe should be more communication between interpretation and automatic speech translation because the communities like develop independent of each other. And um, yeah, as, as you already said, and how this, this web series is for is to educate each other. And I think that's just where it's coming from that people weren't really looking too much into what humans do. They were just combining techniques. Thank you. The question is, um, I think, an easy one. You just have to vote. In the light of everything you have heard and learned in this series of webinars on AI and the interpreter, do you feel that human interpreting still has a future? So the poll is now live. Please vote and we'll report on the results later um, in this session. Um, 
The next question I'd like to put to you before we move on to Slido, because I know that there will be plenty on Slido as well, but this is an important one. And this is another one that we uh, harvested from the previous webinars, if you like. And it's about multilingualism. So when you think about it, artificial intelligence and devices and, and automated speech translation, would it, it is it possible that it will contribute to a more multilingual world? because uh, people appreciate being able to speak their own language. Do you, who and is this to? Or is this? Everyone and anyone. Will, do you want to start? I know yeah, that this me, is. If you don't mind, let me start on this. Um, uh, this ties back to kind of my previous career before I got into speech translation. I actually worked on endangered lang language work. So I worked with languages that are you know, on the path to, uh, to death, basically languages that are dying. And just as that's happening, as we're losing significant linguistic diversity in the world, as a lot of languages are perishing, we have the technologies that are coming along in some ways that I think can help save them. Because what would be amazing to me is have a world where it doesn't matter what language you speak, right? You can speak in your native language and everyone can understand you. Now we're a long way from having technologies like that. But imagine, if you will, where you have a technology that works somewhat well for, let's suppose, a speaker of Mayan or Hmong or, you know, Tokpisin, languages that maybe we don't have an interpreter for, and the technology exists for that language. The ability to be able to communicate in that language, for that person to be able to communicate in that language, I think, is a godsend in a way, because otherwise they wouldn't get anything at all. They would get white noise because they wouldn't understand the signal that's coming at them. So. I, I take the hopeful stance that I think technology will help us ultimately. It's not meant to replace interpreters. I think, again, we keep saying this over and over again. I think it's absolutely true. Interpreters are always going to be better, at, at least at any point in the, in the near term, than automated systems. But we can, automated systems give us uh, the kind of a, a breadth, if you will, that we may not be able to have uh, with, with human interpreters. Thank you very much. I it's I knew this question was right up your alley. <laughs> Anyone else would like to come in on that? Tom. Um, yes, I, I, I'm, I'm always intrigued when people talk about a multilingual world or a more multilingual world, because um, does that mean that everybody can speak several languages or does it mean that everybody speaks their own language? And um, actually, I think from, from an interpreter's perspective, what you want is for everybody to be as monolingual as possible, uh, except for the interpreting community. Um, uh, joking aside, I mean, what we see in the European Parliament is that we have a number of members who, who absolutely need us. I mean, they cannot... Uh, converse in another language and and those those people are, are our rocks um, in the interpreting community these are the people who need us and will always uh, shout and stamp their feet until they get interpreting but what we see is a, a large gray zone of people who can converse in usually English but sometimes French or, or even German and that gray zone uh, over time has has, has increased um, maybe we could argue that people are happier to to speak with a lower quality of a second language and uh, maybe we argue that that people are getting better at their second or third language uh, whichever is the case what we're seeing is is um, in all of the institutions I think um, a, a move towards English but but I just wanted to stress one thing because from my, the, the previous uh, intervention it, it may have sounded a bit bleak um, what we saw with COVID uh, this last year um, was actually relatively surprising in the sense that demand for interpreting remained very high and we were not able to meet that because of the the, the, the situation the, the the pandemic and um and it caused an in uh, an unbearable amount of pressure M members were demanding interpreting it caused a huge huge problem for the services and and if you think about the alternative that, that members of parliament could have said okay we'll do without it for the time being but just get it back to us when you can that would have been a, a killer blow for our service. And I think it would have been a terrible development for the interpreting profession. Actually, members stamped their feet quite legitimately and said, we demand our languages and, and you have to do everything in your power to get them back, uh, a process that we're still uh, trying to, to, to implement. And I think that shows that, um, that, that, that interpreting is here to stay and, and has a solid future. Um, I, I can't comment on the, the state of maturity of the technology, but it, there, there is one, uh, consideration that I don't think has been brought up yet, which is we have to remember our clients and 
whether or not they want to listen to or read um, a, a transcript uh, it, uh, of, a, of an utterance that's been put into, into text, uh, or whether they want to listen to a synthesized voice all day. Uh, these are people who want human interaction. If COVID has taught us one thing, it's that humans value uh, human interaction. They need other human beings to talk to and to be convinced by it and to persuade. And, and that process of, of discussion is, is an innately human, human uh, endeavor. So I, I have no fears for, for interpreting uh, as a human activity, at least for the, for the medium term, uh, and, and only technolo technological development will tell us what, what the long term holds. Thank you very much. I, I think we've all, we've all agreed on that. The human interaction element is absolutely crucial. Uh, but as for the voices that you mentioned, I, I think AI is getting better. I think we'll mention that at some point and we saw presentations uh, from Synthesia. Uh, so uh, we'll see, we'll see. Um, okay, I know that there's lots of questions on Slido. So let us move on to Slido. Um, before, before we, result, we announce the results of our polls. Okay. Um, the most popular one seems to be, what are the new skills interpreters should learn in order to be fit for the future? Antonio and Naomi, for now, and then Tom. L ladies first. Okay. Um, yes, <laughs> I have a lot of things going through my head. To be fit for the future, interpreters need to be adaptable and flexible. They need to be as I said in one of my, my recent coffee chats, they need to view themselves as technologists. They need to be capable of embracing and understanding technology to the extent that they can work effectively. It, it can be a daunting and frightening world, but if you break it down into simple components, any technology can be learned, basically. All of there, everyone has to learn a new vocabulary. We're all learning a, a vocabulary about streaming. <laughs> it's the same for interpreters. You need to learn a new vocabulary for this new world. Be flexible and adaptable and open to change. Beautifully said. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to come in? Uh, Antonio, you said ladies first. I'm not sure whether you have anything to add. I was trying to get away from it, ladies first, and then I. No, I thought you say, "Oh, I agree, way. Naomi," and that's it. <laughs> no, I, I, yes, I was going to say I agree with what Naomi said. I think flexibility is a key word, and let, let's let's uh, ideally, for the moment, move away from the from the uh, contractor relationship between NAIC and the UN system. But I think, as a general rule. Uh, there has to be some flexibility uh, to introduce. There has to be a, a a way in which, and I am one of the I'm one of these people that are scared of technology. I mean, I've I've, I've got a watch and I still don't know how to set it. So I'm, I'm, I I panic where every time I have to do something, I have to ask one of my sons to do it for me because I, I I I'm absolutely scared of technology. But that's one thing that interprets to me. We have to do and adapt this to. Uh, familiarize themselves. We started off in uh, in uh, back in April having meetings had on a on a remote platform, and some interpreters were absolutely horrified. So no 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 no, I can't I can't deal with this. This is too different. Now three four months down the line, and I'm very grateful to many of your colleagues. They have um, said, hang on, let, let let's sit down, let's have a look at this. What do I need? Do I need to improve my internet connectivity at home and have a, an upload speed or download speed on such and such a thing, or so many ramps or whatever it is? I mean, I, I'm reciting the technology and the terminology. I have no idea what it all means, but there has been a high number of of interpreters who have actually adapted to these developments because the um, it wasn't a market choice. It was something imposed by a natural disaster, which is a pandemic, and no one was expecting, no one had foreseen. Um, some people say, oh, yes, he was expecting him within one year and 25 years, whatever it is. But it just happened almost overnight. So the, 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 we had no reaction time. But 
men interpreters actually um, had a positive attitude. And now I have more and more of our regular pool of interpreters who have, number one, they have um, restructured the internet connectivity. They're up to speed to the requirements of a remote platform. They have worked on a number of remote platforms and they're confident they can actually conduct meetings. There are challenges. There are always gonna be challenges. Someone that says, um, that holding a conference on a remote platform is, is plain sailing, if you pardon me the pun working for the IMO, it's not true. They, 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 you know, they, they're gonna have, they, they, they're gonna be issues right, left and center. We have um, clearly stated with our interpreters that if the connection is bad, as soon as one of the team says the speaker is inaudible, then interpretation has to stop and delegates are aware of that. And we remind them at the onboarding sessions of every meeting. If the quality of the incoming sound is not good enough, interpreters, you, you can work magic, but you can't, uh, you can't make miracles. You know, they, they just, it's, 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 it's impossible. So uh, flexibility, readapting to, to change the technology and perhaps instead of staying two steps behind and having to catch up quickly when something like COVID-19 happens, try to be a, a step ahead or right up to pace, or at the same pace as technology um, and, uh, and, and developments. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not a miracle worker. Very well said. Um, what you said, Antonio, about being one step ahead, this is precisely why we are organizing those webinars. I think we need to know more. And uh, the uh, the question that somebody put on Slido, the very popular one, is actually brilliant because I think it needs we need more marketing skills and being able to sell ourselves better, not just vis-a-vis -vis our competitors, human competitors, but now also machines. Tom, do you would you like to come in on that? Yes, I do. Um, um, I think it's worth remembering that uh, when we got hit by the COVID crisis and um, uh, and, and everybody was a little bit uh, knocked for six. Uh, members of parliament, the clients of interpreting all over the world, in fact, uh, were also uh, trying to cope with a very unusual situation. Um, people didn't know how to interact in online conferences in, and they were attempting to apply uh, what they do on a video call with their family or <laughs> with friends in a very formal and uh, parliamentary setting. And it, it, it was it was a, a process that everybody had to go through. We had to learn, we had to teach, we had to, to, to learn from our mistakes and, and, and it was it was painful. Um, it took time. And I think this is the same process has been happening across the different institutions and probably across the, the, the private enterprises that are involved in interpreting around the world as well. And I think we're in a position now at the start of 2021 uh, where we understand a little bit better how all of these things work. Um, you said, uh, what should interpreters learn for the future? How should they be best prepared? Well, I, I can only agree with Naomi and Antonio. Um, being flexible is really, really important. Uh, but there's also one one hobby horse of mine, which is I think interpreters in general and perhaps uh, students of interpreting particularly uh, should understand better or uh, more in depth how interpreting is requested and how meetings are put together and the, the purpose that it serves at the end of the day. Uh, because there's very little, or at least in, in the interpreting course that I took, there was very little focus on um, how, the context in which interpreting takes place. And given the fact that we're now in such a disruptive environment and those meetings are taking place in a very different way to the way they were a year ago, um, I think it's really worth people understanding that we're in a state of constant flux at the moment. And this is affecting your role as interpreters and, and it, you will be much better positioned to be able to do a good job and to protect yourselves for the future as well. If you understand the way that the market around you is, is, is in flux, and um, not just the market, of course, but also the institutional uh, workflows and processes. So I, I think a good um, workbench for the future for, for interpreters would be not just to be flexible and to understand technology and to, to, to keep uh, on top of technology, but also to understand um, the way in which meetings are changing. It's interesting what you said about disruption. Uh, and it sort of ties in with what Antonio said um, about the threat, the threat coming from the outside world, not necessarily technology as such, but we are in a crisis and the disruption is a result of this, of that particular crisis, not necessarily AI. So we have to look at it 
together in a, in, a, in a broader context. So thank you for this. There, there are more questions. Okay, and uh, the next question is about robots um, that may not replace interpreters 100%, but how much will AI affect the demand for interpretation? Do you expect the interpretation market to shrink? I think Will said something about that before, and I think I know what he'll say. So let me start with Will, just a few words of introduction, because I think you, you said something that we want to hear, that will music to our ears, and then we'll hear some probably harsh truths maybe from Naomi, well, let's see. Yeah, so uh, uh, I just look at the analogous scenario of machine translation. Uh, everyone, you know, when machine translation was first coming into vogue, uh, you know, the translation industry was like, oh, it's going to destroy us, it's going to decimate the, uh, the industry, and we saw the complete opposite. In fact, uh, the translation industry grew, uh, grew significantly with the advent of, of these technologies. And I would think, honestly, uh, with the right technologies, the right tools, that the same thing will happen with interpretation. I think people's eyes just open up, oh, this is something we can do. We need a human inter interpreter in this scenario now where they might not have done it before. So I, I think we'll see a growth in the industry rather than a, a contraction. Thank yeah. you. Naomi, you're a private um, market expert. expert. I absolutely agree with Will. I, the, first of all, the language industry has been growing. It is projected to grow. It has grown during the pandemic. And I see AI as, as contributing to this growth. Absolutely. It is going to make the entire world aware as I said earlier, of the language, uh, linguistic diversity, and people are going to expect it and demand it and say, I can have that. And our job, especially in the conference interpreting world, is to differentiate and point out the benefits to human interpretation and when it is more appropriate to use human interpretation. But the demand is going to increase. Absolutely, I see this as an opportunity. It's an opportunity for interpreters, not a threat. Um, there is a question about uh, settings and appropriate settings. Uh, so Ulla asks about technical and medical meetings where interpersonal dynamics um, play a lesser role than at political ones. I think we've touched upon this a little bit and it's uh, connected with the next question, which is the right context for use of AI. I think it's um, Naomi's favorite subject. And you mentioned Travis. Would you mind telling us more about it? C communication with plumbers, etc. Sure. Um, I have a Travis. It's a little hard to see right now, but um, it's fully charged so that I can use it. I use AI all the time. <laughs> I use it for casual conversation. I live in Brussels, which is a, a land of three official languages. But the truth is that Brussels is far more ling linguistically diverse than those three languages. It is the most international place I have ever been. Uh, one of my favorite things to do when I go on a walk in the local parks around the lakes is to count how many languages I hear on the walk. <laughs> and believe me, it's a, a short walk. It's usually in the, the eight to 10 range eight to 10 different languages on a walk. If I want to connect and communicate, I, I need artificial intelligence because my French is terrible. My Flemish is non-existent, although somewhat passive um, because I do speak some German. But for casual conversation, um, informal medical situations where I am not afforded an interpreter, AI is fantastic. The, the goal is to connect and to, and to communicate. Um, where AI can do that well and do that better than humans, um, provide accessibility. I can't hire an interpreter to come to my house to speak with the electrician or the handyman that needs to come. There are absolutely appropriate uses of AI. I focused right now on the more um, casual uh, tourist um, travel, that kind of thing, daily living in this context. But I can think of many, many other uses. Um, my sister works in 
affordable housing. And there are many, many situations where they need to communicate with those who are in need of, of affordable housing services, and they cannot, these are nonprofit organizations that do this, they cannot have afford interpreters except at a, at a more official level, but at a lower level of communicating, showing people properties, um, filling out forms and those sorts of things, AI is fantastic. So I hope that answers your question, Monica. It's always a question about context and appropriate use. And um, I, I rewatched Jan's presentation and uh, he talks a lot about context and data, 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 you know, efficiency of data, availability of data, quality of data. So this is the magic word. And your mantra uh, seems to be Naomi, appropriate use, the right context. I think this is a great conclusion from, from this particular part of the debate. Um, if we can, uh, there is a question that seems to be, um, again from Naomi, actually. Apparently, RSI platforms are harvesting human interpretation to develop AI without acknowledging and paying for IP rights. Is it true or false? Any opinions? Um, I'm not sure whether Tom or Antonio could offer anything on that. Yes, Tom, okay. Well, I don't actually have a, um, a knowledgeable opinion on it, but um, I'm quite interested in the answer myself. My question actually uh, is sort of second question to follow up that, that, that original question is, if RSI platforms are using um, interpretations to sort of gather the big data that's needed to train um, artificial intelligence, um, is there not sufficient written translation to be able to do that? And I would have thought that, I mean, with all the respect I have and the love I have for, for, for interpreting as a profession, um, translations are done with the, the benefit of time and they tend to be um, more accurate as a result. Uh, could, could it not simply uh, use the written form to, to generate those automatic um, or that big data that's needed? Naomi, do you have any um, insight, input that you could yeah, give us now? Um, it's a really interesting question. And I do not know specifically about every platform company. I do know about the platform companies that I work with the most and my company works with the most and they are not doing that. Uh, in some cases, I'm not gonna call it, I hesitate to call it data, <laughs> but in some cases things are recorded, but it is more for quality assurance for training staff on how to respond to problems that interpreters in particular encounter. Um, it is to analyze, in some cases, it's to analyze the sound quality and the delivery quality of the interpretation, the incoming sound and the outgoing sound, um, the, the actual content uh, nobody cares about and it's expunged. But it is a very interesting question and I would encourage all interpreters to read the fine print in the contracts. And in many cases, this means going to the platform company's website and digging deeply for the disclosures and the fine print uh, that can be maybe three to seven pages long of micro print buried on the bottom of a website through multiple links. Read it and see, see what it says. And if it says that your data is being collected, call the company and ask them what it's being used for. Get into the specifics. Don't be afraid to ask. I, I've done that. And what was the result? The result was that they were not actually using the information as it was stated in the contractual fine print that was there to protect them in case it was um, in case it was collected, uh, but they were not, and they changed it as a result of that. One company did that. Hmm, interesting. What Tom asked um, about data, I think your question was about data. Is it not better to use translations instead of recordings of speeches and, uh, and their interpretations? This is a question that I think uh, should be put to our experts. When we think about data, what's better? Um, Go ahead, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I can say that currently we are mainly using text data. So that's where we're currently training on. 
there is some new development where, where we're using audio, so the original speaker with together with the text translation. But currently, I would say there's minimal use of really a source language, source language audio and target language audio. There might be some rare research directions, but it's not what is commonly, commonly used in all the products. It's more like in the research community, I think there would be an interest to have this data to analyze it, uh, but currently it's just not available for us. And uh, that's why most of the systems are built on, on text data. Um, I, I'm, I think, I mean, of course, for us, it would be interesting. Can we learn what, what interpreters do? But as, I mean, there is the IP and, and there's a good right that you created that currently I think it's not really done. So we are really training on, uh, on uh, text data. But audio is used for, uh, for transcription though, and that's, it's essential for transcription. So to generate the, uh, for an automated system to generate the initial monolingual transcription, you have to have audio with text that, that's required to be able to train those systems. I did wanna say one thing on the AI side, uh, the collection of data. I mean, in the era of GDPR, uh, companies really need to be upfront about what it is that they're collecting and how they're using the data. Uh, if they're not, they're violating, they, they may in fact be violating the law. Thank you. Antonio, you wanted to add something to it. Uh, very briefly from, from the point of view of, a, of an event manager and an organizer, um, do not be afraid of, ask, of asking the question. When, uh, when we did approach the RSI platform we are using currently, that was one of the first questions we asked. We said, you know, who, who Whose who's propriety is it? You know, what do you do with the with, with the recordings if we ask the recordings? And we had to clarify that at the start that there is no recording binder, there's no harvesting from the platform. The recordings, if we ask them that they're propriety of the organization, they're not to be retained by the platform. We do not ask them to record it. We are recording in-house and the audio files that the IMO publishes, which are um, password protected for IMO delegates, but they are um, accessible but not downloadable. Thank you. Uh, the ownership uh, bit is really important. I think Debbie may come in on that later and maybe uh, say to well tell us what the chat says because I think there are some interesting comments. Let us move on to the next question which is okay this one's okay. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on the setting of the AI interpreted event you described, Naomi, uh, the one which you said exceeded your client's expectations. Could you say something more about this? Because I think people are really curious, yeah. if you can, obviously. Yes. Um, that event was for a very small number of listeners, and it was highly structured with professional, excellent, trained public speakers who were speaking only one speaker at a time. There was no panel, there was no discussion, there was no Q&A, and there were very clear transitions from one speaker to the next, um, including music. So it, it ended up being a very good setting to use AI in because the AI uh, input, the, the audio input was very clear. Uh, it was a, a very high level production. So we knew that the audio quality was going to be very good. And the speakers, going back to would the speakers be amenable to, to changing how they speak? In this case, the speakers had already done that. They'd already basically been trained for the purpose of this event to speak and present in a certain way and they had to cer follow certain rules. So I knew that the outcomes were going to be better than at most of the events that we do. Thank you, that's really interesting. Shall we hear from Debbie? Uh, because she has some, uh, she, has, uh, she has something to tell us about the chat because there are some interesting comments. Debbie? So yes, there was just uh, some comments about obviously all this um, 
all the interpreting and translation being harvested and maybe profits should be shared. Linda Fitchett mentioned maybe share those profits with the translation and interpreting associations. And we got a really nice comment from Peter Hayes in the chat, who was of course one of our speakers last week introducing Isla to us. Um, so what does he say? He says, um, or the interpreter or interpreting agency should be given the capability to own the data, like a translation memory file. So if they want to move to another company for translation, they wouldn't have the benefit of all the training that had been done. So I think um, it's definitely, we've had some very good comments in the chat, but of course also just a very lively debate. So um, yeah, it's um, always good to share. I think it's time to announce the results of our poll. So the uh, Louise, are you there? Can we? Yes. Can I we am. hear from you about Let me the? Just show you the results. Okay. the The question was: In the light of everything you have heard and learned in this series of webinars on AI and the interpreter, do you feel that human in, feel that human interpreting still has a future? Yes, and happily, as you can see, the result is a. Uh, fairly resounding yes with 76 percent of people who voted saying that they do feel that human interpreting still has a future um and you know um i think this sums up um the webinar very well and the discussion that we've just had because we've heard that the language industry is in flux we've heard that the interpretation industry is facing many different threats and interestingly that ai isn't the biggest threat but we've heard also um, optimistic things like the fact uh, Naomi said that the language industry is growing and has grown even during the pandemic. Um, and we've also heard um, that we as interpreters, if human interpreting is to have a future, we need to be adaptable, we need to be flexible, we need to be willing to embrace new technology. We've all been doing a bit of that over the last few months, I think. And we need to be more aware, said Tom, of the context in which interpretation takes place and how meetings are changing. So yes, we're going to have to adapt. Um, the industry is in flux, but thankfully we can be optimistic too. And I'm very happy, I think we're all happy that 76% um, of those who voted share that optimistic view. And perhaps I could just, um, tag on to that, Monica, a question for you, because um, all of us here know that Monica has worked very hard to put these webinars together. Yes, there's been an organising committee, but Monica is the, um, this is the brainchild of Monica. And um, I'd like to ask you, Monica, are you more or less optimistic now about the future of human interpreting um, than you were when you started planning this series of webinars. And really, we're talking about a period of 18 months to two years that these webinars have been in the planning. So yeah, are you more or less optimistic? Thank you for putting me on the spot like that. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for your kind words. It's been, I mean, it's all team effort. We know that. Without the organising committee, we wouldn't really be able to do anything. Um, I am more optimistic. Are you surprised? I was very yes. pessimistic yes. at the very beginning. I was. Um, I do generally believe that uh, we have a future, but we only have a future if we have the right approach to the whole subject of AI. This is the most important thing. It's not really about adjusting to AI. It's about knowing about it. And also the, the knowledge part is extremely important because you're not just dealing with AI. You're not dealing with the facts you actually have to think about what your clients perceive as facts. So the perception part is extremely important. And I have to say, um, I'm really glad that we've clarified so many things during these webinars. And I'm not just saying that because it's, you know, it's our project, but I really truly believe that the experts that we've had, um, they, they really shared they're really shedding so much light, like literally uh, there's been so much darkness. And I, I think it's all getting, you know, we've got the right context now. And uh, although we had been doing lots of reading about the subject, it's good to talk to actual people who know the subject very well. And people like Will, people like Jan, people who are involved in recruitment, who like Tom and Antonio, um, who know more about the, the, the um, 
requirements of the organizations it's brilliant and Naomi who's so knowledgeable about private market uh, I think we need to do like a separate session about RSI and AI and all these links because you seem to know the subject very very well and you've got lots of thoughts about this so thank you very much and thank you everyone it's it's been such a pleasure such an adventure um, you know that this is our last webinar in the series, um, so we, we do know that there is so much more to say. Uh, for example, we've only skimmed the topic of signed languages and accessibility, and there are more devices on the market to, to perhaps be looked at. Uh, so maybe someday we will pick up the thread, or perhaps someone else will. I suppose it would be better if someone else did that, because uh, we're sort of AI'd out and Zoomed out. But for now, our region will focus on other topics. And so stay tuned. We look forward to seeing you again at one of our future events this year. And I wanted to thank our speakers, especially this evening, but also those who joined us back in December and earlier this month, uh, because they are all knowledgeable experts. Also generous people who spent a lot of time, I have to be very honest with you, that was a lot of time preparing, rehearsing, coordinating. I mean, they, they ran rehearsals with each other even, not just with us, uh, presenting, answering questions. And, uh, and importantly, perhaps, and quite surprising, I have to say, even those who make commercial use of the AI, AI technology were very open and frank about its limitations. And at some point I thought, okay, there might be some tensions because we've got two competitors, but there wasn't. There actually was a lot of openness in that debate. And uh, I think it's it really, it really needs to be appreciated because we as interpreters, I mean, mostly here we had interpreters um, and AIC members, uh, a, lo a lot of us are AIC members. We are a very tough audience. So we really appreciate all those experts and, the, and their, um, the willingness to share, their generosity. I wanted to also, on that note, thank the uh, volunteers on the organizing committee and everyone who have has contributed, and all of you who joined us on this AI odyssey, if you like, uh, on this amazing journey. I really hope we can see uh, one another, we can see each other again, maybe at some other event. And um, I'm really grateful. We are very grateful. Thank you so much. And I'd like to um, ask the Bureau to perhaps join us on, on screen so that everybody can say goodbye. And again, Antonio, Will, Tom, Jan, thank you so very much. And thank you, Louise, for taking care of our Slido and summarizing so beautifully. It was a really difficult job, I imagine. And Debbie. Devi, who's uh, taking care of our chat, and Monica helped, and Francoise. Stephanie, unfortunately, can't be here, but uh, you've done a brilliant job. Thank you. And you were very, very, very quick with all those. I, I saw that chat and just, you know, all those replies. That was absolutely amazing. So thank you again. Uh, I don't know if I'm sad or I'm relieved. That is the end. <laughs> but, but I have to say it's been an amazing journey. Thank you for being with us. Thanks so much and goodbye. Have a good weekend and perhaps see you sometime this year later. Thank you.